Take a group of good friends, a lazy stream, and a bright summer's day. Add enough canoes to go around, and you've got a surefire formula for fun and relaxation. And there's the added bonus of fresh air and exercise. With few exceptions, no matter where you live, there's a good canoeing stream within a few hours drive. Whether you own or rent a canoe, you have an opportunity to escape to a wonderful world of water and nature. In paddling, like most other activities, there's a right way and a wrong way. Getting started the right way is simple. Master a handful of basic strokes, learn a bit about reading moving water, and you'll be off to a good start. Then you'll be able to make the canoe do what you want it to do and not what the river wants. Today we're joining forces with a group of Indiana paddlers for a trip down the Hoosier State's Wildcat Creek. Come along, you'll have fun. And you'll learn the basics, which make canoeing both easier and safer. Canoes and paddles both come in a wide variety of materials and designs. Each will have its own handling characteristics and subtleties. For our purposes, we'll define a good generic canoe simply as one which its owner uses and enjoys. And while we're on dry land, let's settle some other definitions. The bow is the front of the canoe, and the stern is the back. Now these side rails are called gunnels, and the crossbars, thwarts. Now the gunnels and thwarts help to maintain the canoe's shape. Got it? Bow, stern, gunnels, thwarts. Let's take a look at some paddles. While they all have either straight or bent shafts, they all have three basic parts. The grip, the shaft, and the blade. Now, regardless of design, their purpose is the same, to move the canoe through the water. Now, the power face is that side of the blade which actually works against the resistance of the water. There's one other essential piece of equipment. Federal and state laws require that all boats be equipped with one Coast Guard-approved flotation aid for each person on board. Now, most experienced canoeists opt for a Type 3 flotation aid. A good one is light, comfortable, and cut to allow freedom of movement. You'll hardly know you're wearing it. And wearing it is the key. When you need a flotation aid, you need it on, not somewhere in the canoe, or worse yet, strapped to a thwart. There are several other pieces of gear which will qualify you as a well-equipped paddler. Sandy's laid out the contents of her waterproof gear bag so we can take a look. Now, a hat and sunglasses are handy, particularly late in the day when the glare of the sun on the water cuts visibility. And, since weather can be unpredictable, it's wise to pack rain gear and a warm sweater. If you're really off to the boonies, a map, compass, and good guidebook are essential. A flashlight with new batteries and some munchies prepare you for times when you've misjudged your distance and you're out on the water later than expected. Now, a whistle lets you signal between canoes or call for help with three sharp blasts. And finally, there are three essentials. One, an extra paddle in case one breaks or gets lost. Two, a good roll of strong tape. And three, a first aid kit. So much for equipment. Let's head for the water. Tandem paddlers have a simple method of getting into a canoe. While one steadies the craft, the other person gets in and, with hands on the gunnels, walks down the center line in a crouched position. The first person can then use a paddle to brace the canoe while the second person steps into the stern. Ideally, we'd use this method of entry right up against the bank but low water has forced the paddlers well into the stream. With both paddlers aboard, your canoe should ride level in the water. It may feel tippy the first few times out, but remember, the lower you are, the more stable your canoe. Drop from the seat to your knees with your legs spread to the sides. That shift makes a big difference in stability, and it's the preferred position when paddling turbulent or fast water. Now we're ready to tackle the job of getting from here to there. With your paddle, you can pull the canoe forward, backward, sideways, or diagonally. Hold the paddle so that the power face, the side of the blade that's actually working against the water, is just above the water and nearly parallel to it. 
like a beaver's tail. Maintain that relative position anytime the blade is out of the water. Then if the canoe starts to roll, you can instantly brace the blade against the water to give stability. A low brace is normally a white water maneuver, and we're not gonna teach it here. It's not as easy as it looks, but even in quiet water, it's handy to have available in case you start to capsize. Now for the forward stroke. Keeping the blade nearly parallel to the water and twisting slightly at the waist, reach with your lower arm and shoulder and swing the blade forward. At full reach, stab the blade into the water with the blade pointing forward at about a 30 degree angle. Push your upper hand straight forward and pull back with your lower hand to set the paddle nearly vertical. Your lower hand will now be near your hip. Don't pull back any further or the blade will be lifting water rather than pulling the canoe, and that slows you down. Now recover. Keep the blade low to the water. Thrust and reach. Stab, push and pull. Recover, and you're ready to start again. The forward stroke used in reverse becomes the reverse stroke that slows or stops the canoe. This may feel a bit strange at the beginning, but the strokes will quickly become second nature. You soon realize that the stern paddler overpowers the bow paddler. The result? The canoe turns away from the side the stern paddler is using. Well, that's normal. The trick is overcoming that natural turn, and there are several ways to do it. You can switch sides frequently. Marathon canoe racers are interested in optimum efficiency with no loss of forward speed. So one of the two paddlers, usually the stern, will anticipate when the canoe is about to veer and will call for the switch. Hut is the standard signal. Switching equalizes the strain on your muscles and moves the canoe in a straighter path. There are other means of keeping to the straight path. The J-stroke and its slight variation, the modern J, are frequently used by solo paddlers and work well when used in the stern of a tandem canoe. Begin the J as you would an ordinary forward stroke. As the paddle shaft approaches your thigh, turn the thumb of your grip hand down toward the water. Watch. Turning your thumb down changes the angle of the blade and forces it out away from the canoe. Let's take it slowly. As your grip hand turns, so does the blade, and it is ultimately forced out. Thumb down, blade out. Recover and try it again. It takes practice, but stay with it. The modern J is essentially the same stroke, but with an added kick. As you near the completion of the stroke, bring the paddle shaft against the gunnel. Now pull in with your grip hand, using the gunnel as a fulcrum to force the blade away from the canoe. That added force simply brings the boat around that much quicker. The J. The modern J. In either case, if you and your partner are working well together, you should only have to use the J or its variation every third or fourth stroke. If it's more than that, then check your coordination with your partner. One of the handiest directional strokes a paddler has available is the draw. It's great for quick changes. It can be used at either end of the canoe or by a solo paddler, and it's easy to learn. Here's how it works. Reach to the side with the power face nearly parallel to the center of the canoe. Go as far out as is comfortable and slightly forward. Now plunge the blade into the water and by pulling in on the shaft and pushing out with the grip hand, pull the paddle toward the side of the canoe. The draw allows quick course adjustments from either end of the canoe, and if both paddlers draw on opposite sides, you can pivot the boat around its center. As you gain confidence and get the feel of the canoe, you'll be surprised how far you can reach with the paddle in your body, putting most of the weight on the blade against the water. Sometimes an obstacle will appear quickly and on the wrong side you won't have time to change hands and sides before a collision. That's when a cross-bow draw can save the day. Watch here. He doesn't change hands. The cross-bow draw is a bit awkward at first and not as powerful as the straight draw, but in a tight spot, it can save you from an unwanted swim. There is another means of turning, one that most manuals don't mention. Still, most of us use it now and then. We may not admit it, but we do. It's called the stern rudder, and it's not really a stroke. 
Here's what it looks like out of the water. Rudder on the right side, and you'll turn to the right. Rudder on the left, turn left. Increase the angle of the blade, and you'll increase the angle of the turn. But remember, for the stern rudder to work, you have to be going faster than the current. If you're not, nothing will happen. The stern rudder is seldom taught because it is inefficient. Using it is like putting on the brakes. Still, it does work, and it's easy to learn. Use it until you're comfortable with the more efficient steering strokes, then phase it out. There's one other stroke that comes in handy. It's called a quarter sweep. You simply use the blade to scribe a shallow arc of not more than 90 degrees through the water. The bow paddler uses a forward sweep, and in this case, the stern contributes a reverse sweep using the back face of the paddle. But remember, if you go past the 90 degree mark, the stroke becomes self-defeating. Stretches of smooth water like this are good places to work on your strokes, to hone those newly acquired skills. Now, they're also good places to play around, and it looks like play is what our group has opted for. Those are the basic strokes you need to get down gentle streams, those rated class one and two on the international scale. One problem on every stream is litter. I haven't seen a creek yet that's improved by empties. That's trite but true. But you carry in full, you can and should carry out empty. But there's a more serious problem here. Coast Guard studies show that alcohol is a factor in more than half of all boating accidents. Now that's bad enough. But the studies also show that drinkers are sinkers. Drinkers are likely to go under once and not resurface. An intoxicated paddler endangers not only himself, but the other members of his party. One of the most common problems on quiet water streams is downed trees and low-hanging branches. They're part of a class of obstacles called strainers. Water can get through them with no problem, but solid objects like canoes and people get caught and strained out. Watch where you're going, and you may be able to avoid the problem. You can lean forward or backward to duck low-hanging branches, but a sideways lean, particularly if both paddlers go to the same side, is usually an invitation to a swim. If you do find yourself swept into a strainer, stabilize the canoe by dropping to your knees and use the branches to help work the canoe to a clear passage or a liftover spot. Now is a good time to talk about the downstream lean. When you're swept into an object like a tree, rock, or log, there's a natural tendency to lean away from it, and that usually means leaning upstream. For the beginner, the result is often a quick dunking. You've lowered the upstream side of the canoe and let water build up against the side, thus pushing the canoe over and the paddlers out. If instead of leaning upstream, you lean downstream, the water acts against the bottom of the canoe and provides lift. In the case of a subsurface rock, it may even lift you off the obstacle. So overcome that initial impulse to lean away. By leaning toward the log or rock, you'll stay in the canoe a lot better. There are a couple of tight spots ahead. Let's follow Russ down this chute and learn one of the basics of water reading. He's following a smooth tongue of water that forms a downstream V. Hold it right here. See what we're talking about? The smooth water is trailing off to a point that points the way to the best route through the rocks below the surface. And the regular ripples at the bottom of the V mark the continuation of the route. We'll bottom out a couple of times at this water level, but still we've picked the best path. Now, this could be a problem. With low water, the only paddleable route hugs the right bank. And as is often the case, there's a log in precisely the wrong spot. Here, the bow has trouble with shallow water and can't get a good bite on her cross draw, but persistence pays off. Then it's back to the right side and both paddlers draw to bring the canoe onto course. As the stern paddler sets up, his partner executes a series of three cross-bow draws. Then as the stern sweeps, the bow returns to the right side for a draw. And they're through. There is uh, one other alternative. That's to walk the canoe around. In this case, I can assure you that it is more a concern for a brand new canoe than a lack of skill. In any event, there is no shame in walking. 
You know your capabilities, and sometimes walking is by far the wisest course. One of the great things about a trip like this is the variety and skill level of the paddlers who are along. There are experts and uh, not so experts. As a beginner, you can learn from all of them. Come on, guys, you should be paddling on opposite sides of the canoe. Well, you made it anyway. That brings up a good point. Talk to your partner. If you're going to change sides, whether it be to even up the strain on your muscles or to set up better for the next shoot, tell the guy or gal who's sharing the canoe with you. It will be a better trip with a little communication. Watch Doris. She drops to her knees to stabilize the canoe, and that's fine. Then she goes to a series of weak backstrokes. A draw would have been more effective. Again, communicate. Talk it over. Decide the best route and the best technique, and then keep talking until you're safely through. As we go down this little chute, see if you can pick out the strokes. Did you get them? Let's try it again. A pair of crossbow draws and then back to the forward strokes. A draw on the bow and the stern rudder gets the job done. How'd you do? We'll go downstream to another series of riffles and try it again. We'll take you through first. Remember, we want to follow that smooth tongue of water which forms the downstream V. Now, watching the others, you pick out the strokes. Let's go through it together. A stern rudder, a crossbow draw. The same, a stern rudder, and this time a series of crossbow draws. Here, a strong rudder, almost a reverse sweep, does the job. A series of bow draws. Note that it's the wrong face of the paddle. The draw would have been more effective using the power face. Although high water is not a problem at this time of year, it's worth mentioning. Floods increase the speed of the current. Although there's usually little turbulence, the current is there. Fallen trees are commonplace, and the high waters often carry a large quantity of debris. And at that greater water depth, recovery is harder. In short, high water is worthy of extra respect. And since high water often comes during cold weather, there's added danger. Cold water numbs both the body and the mind. Hypothermia, the rapid loss of body heat, is a killer. You can become too numb to help yourself in only a few minutes and in 40 degree water, you can be unconscious in as little as 12 minutes. A good rule is to wear a wet or dry suit if water and air temperature combined don't add up to at least 100 degrees. Most of us who own our own canoes use car topping to get the craft to and from the water. Now that doesn't seem like much of a problem, but canoes are lost each year because they weren't tied down properly. A boat that comes off on the highway can cause a serious auto accident even a fatality. While foam blocks can be used to transport your canoe for short trips, you need to use a rack for longer trips. Start the tie down with the canoe centered so that the weight is evenly distributed. 
at least one tie, and preferably two, should go from the crossbars over the top of the canoe. Straps like these are handy, but a stout rope will also do. Just use knots that hold well and are easy to untie. A half hitch knot is perfect. Once the canoe is secured to the rack, tie both the bow and the stern to the car. Pick secure points that are widely spaced. The best spots vary from car to car, or install eye bolts to make the job easier. With the canoe attached to the rack in two places and to the car in four, you're ready for even the windiest of days. One reminder, check the knots periodically as you drive. A knot can work itself loose. If you're driving a small car, you'll find it helps to stow loose paddling gear in a bag and lash it inside the canoe. Stow the paddles, too. The canoe's tied down and you're ready to head for home. I hope you'll stick with canoeing and find it as enjoyable as I do. As in any sport, practice hones your skills and makes the sport that much more enjoyable. Join a club and take trips with experienced paddlers. A lot of good informal instruction is done during club cruises. You'll also find instructional programs offered by many local YMCA's and American Red Cross chapters. The American Canoe Association offers a nationwide program of instruction and instructor certification, and there are commercial schools throughout the country. A course will provide an opportunity for you to cover many things we just didn't have time for. Subjects such as handling and playing in fast water, and river rescue, even the best go swimming once in a while, and riding a capsized canoe. As little as one hour of good instruction can reduce your risk of being involved in a serious canoeing accident. And good instruction will enable you to enjoy the sport even more. Keep on paddling, and we'll see you on the river.